from the Holy Gospel according to John. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen and spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take this out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, Zeal, for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, What signs can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple was under, has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. <laughs> While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, many began to believe in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it all. The Gospel of the Lord. Today is the third Sunday of Lent. We probably have become veterans in the penance that we have chosen for ourselves. Are we already? Or you never become veterans now? You still trying to struggle? Yes. Huh? You know sometimes you ask in America, how are you doing? I'm hanging in there. You really? That's the only one who hangs in there. Mm -hmm. Clear. He's hanging in there. And why is he hanging in there? Any reason? What is the reason? He's hanging in there for me. He's hanging in there for you. So that you don't hang in there. He came, the only one who came to die, not to live. And he died so that we may live. But we do not have another life. We have his own life to live. Because he died so that we may, so that we may live. When, nobody can be sanctioned for doing the same thing twice. The sanction has been taken by him. He's taking the curses. He's taking the death. He's taking on himself. So we have freedom to live. We cannot hang in there anymore. We should not hang in there anymore. Because he has taken our curses. He has taken our troubles. He's taken our miseries. He's taken our disappointments. He's taken our frustrations. He's taken our bitterness. He's taken retaliation. He has taken resentment. He's taken the worries. He's taken the fear, the insecurity, the inadequacies. What else do we need? He's taken out discouragement and disappointment. He has taken it unto himself. Why are you carrying that? 
What are you doing about like? Now I'm going to there. Because it seems that you have lost the connection between you and him. The connection. Victory. He has conquered. He wants us to enjoy that victory. Because he has taken it on himself. He wants us to free ourselves. To disconnect ourselves. From the drudgery and everything. He did it by obedience. He did it through obedience. And you look at the first reading today, talking about the Ten Commandments. God gave his Ten Commandments. Jesus, when he came into the world, he said, My food is to do the will of my Father. Can you imagine if a husband says to his wife, my, my food is to do your will, or the wife says to the husband, my food is to do your will, as Christ has said, or kids who say to their parents, my food is to do your will, mom and dad. <laughs> How do you think our families will look like? The best. We will live for each other. We will not live for the self. That's kind of a preamble. Let's get into it now. Jesus entered the temple. In entering the temple, this temple had been there 46 years. He was there to celebrate the Passover with his fellow Jews. And many Jews have come from the diaspora. Many Jews have come from the foreign nations because they were going to recall the events of the first Passover. And the Passover meal was the instruction given by Moses. Actually, Moses was given the instruction by God to tell the people of Israel to take a lamb, unblemished lamb, one year old, and slaughter and take the blood and smear the lintel of their doorpost. And through that, God brought victory and freedom from the, for the Israelites from the land of captivity, the land of Egypt. So he took them away from, you know, they cried to God because the Egyptians were, were, take, were taking them into slavery. They were molesting them. They were oppressing them and giving them too much labor. And they cried to God, they are only God. And because God is I am, he's always present when his children cry to him. God heard their cry. He sent Moses as an instrument of freedom for them to lead them out of the land of Egypt. So the last plague, the last act, the last sign that God did was the sign of the Passover meal. And so every year, God instructed the Israelites to celebrate the Passover every year as a gratitude for his redemption, for his freedom from the land of Egypt. So they were about to celebrate this. And so every Jew from all over the world will come to Jerusalem, the most holy city of God. And then they were with all this throng of people milling around, and you don't spend you know, a foreign coin there, you exchange your coin. So all this was going on, all this commotion, buying animals for the sacrifice. And Jesus comes in there and sees all this commotion. My father's house should not be a marketplace. My father's house is not a den of robbers or a den of thieves. It's a place of prayer for all peoples. He took out cords and beat them up. That is fiery anger. Holy anger. Because they were doing something that was wrong. Wait a minute. You know, have you? It, I don't know, what, what is the, you know how you, you know, I don't know, among, among the kids here, 
You know, moms know how to take care of their kitchens very well and all that. And, and then, you see kids who always make a mess or don't do their dishes. Say, hey, everything is all set. And then, you make, mess, make a mess of it. Your mom going to be happy with you? <laughs> I don't think so. That's, that's like, that's her domain. <laughs> that's her domain. To mess it up is to mess with her and mess up her environment. I'm yet to see, but I want, I would like to ask, you know, I don't know which, which is the best car in the world now, the most expensive car. Paul, you know, which one is the most expensive car? I don't know. Is it Lamborghini or something? Those ones, maybe those are the old fashioned maybe. Yeah, sorry? Probably not. Yeah, Lamborghini, you know, you have, somebody has a Lamborghini and, and a child, you know, on Father's Day wants to show that he loves his dad so much. And goes to write on the Lamborghini, I love you, dad. Happy Father's Day. And he writes it with a very, very, you know, kind of, you know, piercing iron material. I love you, Dad. Uh, Tom, how much do you think a Lamborghini costs? Two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or maybe yeah. Oh boy, is that the best way to express your love for your Dad on on Father's Day? <laughs> what will be the reaction of the Dad? He paid two fifty thousand dollars to buy that. Paul, I know your name, that's why. And of course, we are not up there looking at, down at me today. <laughs> huh? What are you going to do with that? A son who wants to show, Father, I love you so much. I love you, Dad. That was why Jesus was not... <laughs> His father's house was turned into a den of thieves. He couldn't stand that. He couldn't stand that. They were having an exchange of money. It was not pure sacrifice. It was not pure worship. The house of God is a holy place. The house of God. And Jesus Christ is the new temple of God. And that's why he said, when they said, give us a sign for what you're doing. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days... I will raise it up. He was talking about the temple which is his own body. The temple in Jerusalem was going out of date. The temple in Jerusalem was becoming archaic, was becoming ancient, was becoming something out of it. The new temple is Jesus himself. And that temple was going to be ratified by the sacrifice. So all the sacrifices that were going on there were not going to be for anything. They were going to be vanity, vanity. Empty sacrifices. The only one sacrifice that God wants to reign and, and have in the world is the sacrifices of his only begotten son. And so Jesus was the new temple. Jesus is the new instruction of God. And that's why when you look at the Ten Commandments, Jesus now says, even though he said he has not come to abolish the law and the prophets, he was renewing and saying, now we are going to have love of God and love of neighbor and summarize everything. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the place of worship where we receive nourishment. And through that same cross, Jesus gave us his body and blood. So what do you think Jesus is going to do if he walks into a church today or right there like he's in the tabernacle and then in the church we come and have our useless charter? What is he going to do? Think about us. We're messing with his father's house, isn't it? Or we come into the church and use the church for whatever purposes except for prayer and worship. What do you think he's going to think about us? Looking at us on the tabernacle, hidden, hidden yet present. 
Because the same Jesus who walked the streets of Palestine and Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago is right there in the tabernacle today. Right there in the tabernacle. Looking at us. And you know, the gospel ends in a very well, wonderful way today. It said, uh, Jesus would not trust himself to them because he knew them all. The same way he knows me right now. He knows you. And did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. So he understands us. As Jesus is the temple of God, because in Jesus we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dwelling together. We also have become the temple of God through our baptism. At our baptism, we are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Then we become temples. St. Paul goes ahead to say, we are temples of the Holy Spirit. As temples of the Holy Spirit, we cannot use ourselves anyhow. Not according to the will of God. We cannot use ourselves less than glorifying God. Jesus came to glorify God. We become instruments of glorification of God. We cannot pierce ourselves. We pierce ourselves or have different diagrams or whatever on the body. Just like we cannot write on the Lamborghini, Dad, I love you. <laughs> because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies belong to God. Our bodies serve God. Our bodies are for the glory of God. St. Irene says, man and woman, fully alive and active is the glory of God. When we have sin in us, when we have disobedience, when we have fear, we are not, we are not fully alive. We are kind of cut into pieces. We are not whole. That means we are not revealing the glory of God. That means our actions are not portraying the glory of God. That means we are not extending the reign of God here on earth. As we have a responsibility to take care of our bodies, we have the responsibility to take care of other people's bodies and to defend our God of those bodies. The body is not for sensual pleasure. The body is not for all the other kind of alien things that we do. Every time we do those things, we get ourselves out of the beauty with which God created us and the purpose with which he wants us to use what he has given to us. He wants us to live for him. He wants us to surrender ourselves to him like he surrendered to his father. He wants us also to obey at all times his will, his purpose. Because his will is always to do the, the will of the Father. He doesn't have any other will than to serve the Father. He is the temple of God. That is the word of God. That is the incarnate word of God. The word made flesh. Who stays in the tabernacle day and night? When you receive the body and blood of Christ at Mass, do you actually know you are receiving the body of Jesus? Before coming to receive the body of Jesus, do you actually prepare yourself to make sure that you are free from sin? Or you abandon confession. You know where I come from? <laughs> you know where I come from? Yeah, some people are woken up now. Nigeria. And guess what? When it's time for communion, you are not obligated to stand up from your row because everybody is standing up. You know why? Because <laughs> somebody says, Oh, I have not gone to confession. I need to go to confession before going to communion. But what I discovered is that when we are here, you know, it's like, okay, 
Everybody's getting up. And you get up likewise. But you know in your heart that you have not been to confession. And you have sin in your heart. Then you go to confession first. So that you can be cleansed from sin. You don't receive into yourself the body and blood of Christ in sin. St. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he said you are receiving condemnation and judgment on yourself when you go. You don't need to care about anybody's opinion. You don't need to care about that. That's not important. What is important is doing the will of God. You say, yes. I will receive when I finish going to confession. Because it's just like exchanging money or buying these ritual sacrifices that Jesus saw those days. Because those offend the Father. We now enter into what we call sacrilegious communions, which is receiving communion under the state of sin. We need to be pure, perfectly clean. Then we receive communion. And then you give glory to God. Do you consider that after receiving communion, then we go to thank God, kneel down and thank God at that time for receiving communion, the greatest gift, the gift of God himself, to thank him. Not no prayers, no prayers are needed. All that's needed is thanksgiving. After receiving communion, receiving in a pure heart and then give thanks to God for this special precious gift. That is a beautiful way of receiving communion and giving glory to God. That is being faithful to what communion itself is, the true body and blood of Christ, receiving the entirety of the temple of God into our souls. And we become a dwelling place for God, a place that God dwells, dwelling in our hearts, the Holy Spirit is there, the Father is there, and the Lord Jesus is there. Because where Jesus is, the Trinity is always there. I believe in one God, the Father of God, the maker of heaven, of all things, the visible and the I believe in one Lord Jesus.